Good morning, and it's great, great to see you all here. And uh, it's, it's a blessing that you've come, come along to worship this morning with us. And, you know, you're part of here, or maybe it's your first time, you're very welcome. And for those online as well, it's fantastic to have you, have you with us. And remember that, you know, you might say, well, I'd like to go to church today, but not alone will you be blessed, but you're blessing other people as well by being here. And you mightn't even think of it in that way. Uh, we bless each other, you know, when, when we come together to worship. So my name is Brian, and um, today I want to continue our series, Disciple, and uh, that we've been uh, doing for the last few weeks. And to be a Christian, uh, a follower of Christ is, is the best thing in the world. I'm sure you'll, you have to agree. Um, to have a real relationship with Almighty God, the Creator, uh, of the universe and the creator of our beautiful world and, of course, the country we live in. I was just talking to someone after the first service and they, their work takes them all around the country and, you know, they just say, what a, what a beautiful country we have. And uh, to wake up every morning in the hands and care of God, just think about that, uh, to enjoy the great salvation that only Jesus can give, to know our sins forgiven, the big ones, the small ones, all of it wiped clean and buried in the bottom of the sea. And just remember, forgiveness is available to us every moment of every day. And don't ever think that God will not be forgiving towards us if we have sins to forgive, if we have things to, to bring before. And we can do it every single day, and he will forgive us. In Micah 7, uh, verse 19, it says this, um, you will have compassion on us, it's talking about God. You will trample our sins under our feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. Now, we know how deep the ocean is. And uh, recently there was um, that tragedy that happened to the Titanic because it was so deep, uh, you know, that we know how, how deep it can be. So deep that a human can't really survive uh, outside of being in a submarine. Uh, yeah, he said our sins are, the, you throw them into the depths of the ocean. Hebrews 8 verse 12 says, our sins God has forgiven and forgotten about. I will forgive their sins and their wickedness, and I will never remember their sins. God chooses to forget our sins. Now, God obviously can remember our sins, but he chooses to forget. And we're quite good at remembering our sins. We're quite good at the stuff that we have done, the stuff that we have maybe many years ago, and it comes back to our mind, and then and, and we say to God, oh, you know, that, that thing I did, and, so, and he says, what are you talking about? Because he has chosen to forget what he has forgiven. So just remember that. We also have the company and presence of the Holy Spirit 24-7, and we're sure of a home in heaven. And that's probably the best thing of a whole lot. You know, that uncertainty of what happens after we leave this, this place. And I know as we get older, and I'm getting older, you know, that's a certainty and a hope that's very important to me, and in, as it is to all of us. Uh, we have two families, our natural one uh, and our spiritual one, the families which we were born into and the family um, we were born again into, which is the church family. Our Christian friends with whom we worship uh, and learn more about God and with whom we are in service for the Lord. But with all the, the, this, uh, this, the Christian pathway is not easy. And of course, no one ever promised that it would be. Uh, we struggle with our own sinful nature, something I spoke about uh, previously. We struggle with the world, and of course, if the devil has his way, he will have us doubting our salvation altogether. But being aware of these things helps us to fight the good fight, to stay on the road God has marked out for us to the very end. In Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, the cross in Jesus' day uh, meant one thing, a painful death and crucifixion. Now, he wasn't saying that we all must be put to death by crucifixion, but rather it was a call to self-sacrifice and uh, self-humility for his name. Be prepared for that. When Jesus was teaching his followers at one point, uh, many of them turned away and deserted him, proving that some of his teachings were unpalatable. 
Some things he said were a difficult pill to swallow. And uh, sometimes we, things in Scripture we find hard to understand and some teachings we find difficult to accept. In John 6, verse 36, I just is the, it's when it happened, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him, and uh, Jesus turned to the twelve and said, Are ye also going to leave? And the question Jesus is asking us today, are we determined to follow him right up to the very end? Sometimes I ask myself, uh, why do we find it so hard to do the right thing as believers? You know, we're so blessed in so many ways, and um, yes, we struggle with the world and the influences of the world. We struggle with the love of money. We struggle with our intakes of food and alcohol. We struggle in our relationships. We struggle with our influences, all, the influences all around us in the world. We struggle with our thoughts and our desires. In 1 Timothy 6.10, the Bible says that the, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which, while some craving money, have left the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Money in itself is not evil, but the love of it is. It's like as if, you know, if I can get rich, I can do all things, whereas the Apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Philippians 4, verse 13. So everything we have is given to us by God and belongs to him, and uh, we only have use of it while we are here. Food and alcohol can be a real stumping blocks for the believer. I struggle personally with the love for food, and I try not to be a glutton, but, you know, I, it's a challenge every day. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Alcohol also should be taken in moderation by Christians. Drunkenness is a sin, and if we cannot control our intakes, um, how much we drink, we need to give it up altogether. Adam Clayton, the U2 bass player, if you're into rock music, uh, he became addicted to alcohol and drugs, actually, many, many years ago. Uh, Bono, the, the lead singer, wrote recently these words. He said, the fire Adam was playing with was beginning to play with him. And eventually he got help to overcome his addictions. And recently I heard him being interviewed uh, where he admitted that sobriety is a much better high uh, than the high of alcohol and drugs. And I just read one of the daily newspapers this morning where um, he, he actually said, you know, how long is it since you had a challenge with alcohol? He said, well, yesterday. So it's a challenge every day even though he's been sober for 20, something like 25 years. So the Apostle Paul said, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, verse 8. So we need to be drunk with the Holy Spirit. We need to allow him uh, to flood our, our souls, flood our lives, and, and instead of the other, the other uh, spirit. Paul also said to Timothy, he said, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Little, a little wine. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good reason why we need to treat alcohol with respect, because it has been said that when we are drunk, our willpower is diminished by about 80%. That could create some problems. That could lead us into all kinds of, of trouble. And of course, the culture in our country is very drink oriented and it's difficult you know i mean people who are not christians say you know i'm going to go out at the weekend i'm going to get drunk i'm going to get rotten and you know then they come back and say yeah i got drunk got rotten got sick all over the place we had a great time but um you know it's it's that's the irish culture actually roy Keane, the football player he actually said you know when he started playing football um you know if you lose the match you go out and get drunk and if you win the match, you go out and get drunk. So, it was, it was, you know, so of course, when he went to play in Manchester United, uh, it was a real problem because that drink culture didn't actually fit in with the type of uh, soccer player lifestyle that was over there. And actually, incidentally, he doesn't drink at all now. He doesn't drink alcohol at all. But, um, so Jesus said to his disciples, take up their, he wanted to take up their cross of self-sacrifice and self-humility 
and follow him. And in all these areas, this is what we must do. He also said <coughs> that we, his disciples, are not belonging to this world. He was talking about his disciples when he was prayed that prayer in John 7, verse 16. And he said that his disciples were not of this world. We actually are not of this world. We, we live in this world. We, we exist in this world. But we're actually, you know, citizens of heaven. And we must remember that. And our behavior must be the behavior of citizens of heaven, not of people of this world and, and the worldliness that goes with it. Next thing I want to talk about is relationships, particularly marriage. And if you find yourself in the place where your marriage has broken down, we are so sorry. You find yourself in that place and you're in our prayers. I always find it devastating when a marriage breaks down and how hard it is uh, for all involved. And actually, Ruth and myself would have been close to quite a few relationships broke down over the years. And it's never easy. There's no, there's no easy path, it, it, but it does happen. Don't get me wrong. Human relationships uh, at the best of times are complex. And when applied to marriage, they can be even more difficult. I once heard it said that marriage is the most difficult human relationship that there is, but also the most rewarding you know, it is the most rewarding relationship. And um, <clears throat> uh, the world tells us that marriage is just a piece of paper, a contract that can be easily shredded. And uh, a friend of mine, a farmer friend of mine, I remember having a, a conversation with him. And, uh, you know, he he's a healthy, seemed to have a healthy, strong marriage. And we got to talk about marriage and say, oh, it's just, it's great, you know, and all that kind of thing. He says, it's only a piece of paper which I was very surprised. Incidentally, they're still married after maybe 20 years, I think 25 years. But I, I just thought it was, you know, this is the worldly view. Uh, it's only a piece of paper. But as Christians, this is different. For us, Jesus said in relation to marriage, what God has put together, let not man separate. So let's read uh, Matthew 19, verse 4 to 6. It should be up here behind me. Haven't you read the scripture, Jesus replied, uh, they record from the beginning, God made them male and female, and he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. They're no longer two, but one. Let no one split apart what God has joined together. We have a dialogue uh, here between the Pharisees and Jesus. The highest standard that we can uphold is to stay together in marriage through thick and thin. It is God's desire when we marry that we stay together for life. The scripture shows that as believers that we should be married before we become one flesh, the sexual union. And it also states that marriage is between a man and a woman, contrary to what today's world wants us to believe. And these are the pressures that we are under as Christians. Want, you know, people wanting us to accept their ideals, where we, we want to accept God's standards. And also, which is quite interesting, and this is written 2,000 years ago, but it was actually quoted from Genesis, the book of Genesis. Um, it, you know, God says that there are two specific genders, male and female, and that's another pressure we have in, as Christians. You know, they're trying to tell us that there's different genders and different mixes and all this kind of thing. And we want to do what God wants us to do. We want to do what the Bible says. But I want to say, as, before, as I said before, marriages do break up and divorce is a thing in the Bible. It is second best to what God really desires. It's also a fact uh, that Christians, as Christians, we have a monopoly of God's grace. We understand the concept of being accepted when we don't deserve it. We understand forgiveness like no one understands it. The best way a couple can stay together long term is to give grace as they have received it from God, to be forgiving as God has forgiven them. A marriage will not last by two people walking hand in hand, barefoot in the sand, walking into the sunset, which was my idea of marriage. I thought that's what marriage was all about. Um, now, there's a couple of times that we would have done that over the years. And I remember the last time, I think Ruth complained that her feet were cold, so that kind of took a little bit, <laughs> it took a little bit of a shine off it. But, um, but it's still, yeah, 
It is, of course, there is romance in marriage, but um, that's, that's, that's what happened then anyway. Um, the marriages that you see around that are lasting, which is important to see how other people uh, are staying in marriage, um, are, they're, they're built on a foundation of love and respect. Uh, love is difficult to define um, or to fully understand, but we, we know God's love for us. We understand that it's, it's unconditional. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 gives a good description of what re love really is, how it, how it works out. Love, respect, understanding, friendship, loyalty, grace, forgiveness, successful conflict resolution. And I can add to that resilience, stickability, and sometimes plain stubbornness are all the ingredients that help marriages to last. A wise old friend of mine once uh, said, sometimes couples don't stay together long enough for the marriage to get good. I thought that was a very interesting comment um, because sometimes you think, oh, for five years married, oh, we're, we're going, you know, it's a long time. Or for 10 years married, oh, we're married 10 years, whatever. And to me, if you're 10 years married, you still have the L plate. And if you're heading for 20 years, you've got the N plate, the novice. And as, you know, because it's a lifelong relationship where you grow together and learn to understand each other and love, learn how, how each other works together uh, and, and that. There was a young couple who stayed in our place a number of years ago, and they were from the U.S., and they seemed to be very united and very much in love, and, you know, everything was fine. But when they went back, I was in touch with them and social media, and one day a post was, was put up about um, the fact that their marriage had gone, they'd gone separate ways, and they had grown apart. And I thought that was kind of interesting because um, they weren't together long enough to grow together, to be together, you know, to talk about growing apart. And, you know, that, that's, that's the, 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 the concept that people have sometimes. And... Uh, so, we're different as, as believers, and uh, we're different to the non-Christian people of the world. Romans 12, verse 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So, it's letting God transform us into a new person, changing the way we think. To conclude, I have just focused on a few subjects, of course, but there are many more areas of life that could be spoken about. Our challenge is to be influencers for Jesus in the world and not allow the world to influence how we think. That is our challenge. James 4 verse 4 says, Friendship with the world makes us enemies of God. These are very strong words. How we live is a visible expression of what we believe. At the time of the Second World War, Prime Minister of England Winston Churchill called on his people to volunteer to help out in the war effort. He famously offered them nothing but blood, sweat, and tears. The interesting thing was that his government was inundated with applications from people to get involved. It wasn't an issue that things were going to be tough, that life was going to be tough. They were signing up, and that was it. And that is how it is for us as Christians. We need to sign up and be part and be prepared to change as God wants us to change, uh, to, to be the person Jesus wants us to be, and be determined to leave all that worldly stuff behind us. Leave it behind. And it will be a struggle to the end to be in a world but not have it. Matthew 24, 13 says, the one who endures to the end will be saved. And my final question is, are you and I prepared to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus? Are you up for it? Am I up for it? Let's go for it. Thank you very much. So I'll just pray. just want to thank you, Lord, for our time together again, for this time of worship and for your word, especially your scripture. Um, spoken today, Lord. 
And I just think of that song again, that we surrender all, and that it's not just words and it's not just emotional, but it's actually a, 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 a decision that we are going to surrender everything to you. We're going to leave that life behind us that's not really satisfying us, and we're going to give ourselves wholly and completely to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.